Good evening and welcome to Artist Talk on Art on Monday, March 25th. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Miriam Deutsch, Artist Talk on Art Programming Director. And tonight is our first time we're going to host an open studio with a theme. Um, so tonight's theme is portraiture. We've been We've invited portrait artists to share and discuss their artwork and studio practice uh, with an empathetic audience. And then there will be others, I guess, in the audience too, that maybe are just here um, to observe and discuss and ask questions. So we're asking artists to limit their images to 20. And um, so you're welcome to either share your screen or hold up your uh, work to the camera. So um, I think let's get started. And I think we'll begin with Leah. She she showed up very early and um, we've been chatting already. Um, so Leah, would you like to begin? I would be happy to begin, right? As I was mentioning earlier, I've been a fan of Artists Talk on Art for 15 years at least, maybe more. It goes back a long way. And um, it, in a city like New York, you know, you're always looking for a format where you can actually talk to other artists, not necessarily the ones you already know, but others. And so this is a great opportunity to kind of, you know, put the litmus test. Uh, where am I as an artist, as a portraitist? What I doing look like anything anybody else is doing? Why do I do it that way, et cetera? So yeah, I'm very happy to be here tonight. Um, I expected a lot more people, so I only selected a couple of pieces to share. Um, but let me perhaps give you a little bit of background because I've been making art for mm, over 40 years. And my training was at the um, Academy of Beaux-Arts in Paris, France. And as most everybody knows in those days and even to today, we worked from live models and figurative work was very essential to forming an artist professionally and technically. And so we had live models uh, at one experience, which I, you know, some, some things mark you tremendously um, we had one live model that I, I've never forgotten. She was beautiful. She was young. She was probably 20. She had, the, you know, the perfect figure. And we're about 20 students in the studio. And after about 20 minutes, everybody kind of drifted away from their pedestals and stopped working. And so we kind of buzzed together, like, what was going on? And they said, there was just nothing to capture. It was just like, it wasn't a person, it was just a form and a shape and it was too lovely for words. The next week we got a model, she was probably 50. She had had multiple pregnancies. Her body was literally ravaged by the life she had lived. And it was one of the most exciting sessions we ever had in working with a live model. There was just so much material to work with. And um, I did a really big piece of her. I still have it, it's still one of, one of my favorite works. Um, the portrait, well, why the portrait? Um, I started doing portraits early on at, at the Beaux-Arts and I just kept going. And I have to say, I must have a very stubborn streak in me because nobody was showing portraits. Nobody wanted representational art. Nobody wanted the figurative. And I just kept doing it. I don't know why, you know, I accepted that it was highly, highly improbable that I would find a gallery that would embrace what I was doing. And the one time I did show my portraits in New York, the show was up for six months and nobody ever came back and said, I want to do a show of your portraits, right? So I think that's kind of um, interesting. My personal belief is that this, return to interest in the figurative came about because of the iPhone, because of the camera, that suddenly you know, everybody's holding that camera up and they're seeing two eyes and they're seeing a mouth, they're seeing a face and they're, and they're getting a big kick out of it, you know? And suddenly you'd go into a museum and 
there'd be something figurative that had crept into the show. And now I think it's back in, in style. And especially interesting that many of the art schools um, stopped teaching portraiture. It too was no longer of interest in the educational system. So to do one, a portrait and to be able to do it well is uh, hard to find now. So that of course makes it very interesting in, in the art world. Like how, do, how does somebody do that? Um, I'm gonna start with a screen share. And I don't know whether you prefer having um, questions at the end or as we go. What do you prefer? Uh, I think that if you get excited about something, you should, you know, jump I, in. I think we're small enough that people can just uh, okay. ask their questions. Okay, so I pulled this up because just yesterday I received news that I had won the Outstanding Women Artist Achievement Award for Manhattan Arts. And Manhattan Arts has been around for a very, very long time. They have a very large scope of work that they appreciate. They are, of course, um, honoring the Women's Month, the Women's History Month. And I did a, an interview with them. You can go and you can see this interview. And this was the work. Let's see if I can get this off. This was the work that was responsible for that award. Okay. Um, a lot of the questions about doing the portraiture are, are also in the interview. So if you look it up, you you might you know get some extra information about it. Uh, I'm going to take this off now, and I'm going to show that picture from here. Okay. So this is a a portrait that I did very close to me. It is of my daughter. She was in her teens, going through puberty, and she was unconsciously, subconsciously feeling all those changes going on in her body and in her thoughts. And she came to me and she said, I want a baby. And I thought, oh my God, no, don't do that. <laughs> you know, you're way too young. I'll make you a baby. And so I created this portrait of her. And as was one of my themes, the subject would have on their head some kind of adornment that represented what was going on inside their head. So the fact that she wanted this baby, I put this baby that was in her thoughts visibly onto her head. I wrapped it in a bow and made it like a gift. And I used as the form for the baby, and I'll show you the back. Okay. I used, as I said uh, in, in our earlier conversation, we were talking about some of the experience I had. I, I'm a big traveler and I was in Africa. So I, I put the baby on her head, wrapped the way the women carry their babies in Africa. The baby is a combination of a doll and a fetus. And on her back, this area on her back is a chest plate that the men wear in Africa as warriors. So I'll go now back to the front of it. If anybody has any questions about this, go for it. No? Okay. Uh, second piece. Uh, can I ask you to say size? Did you say the size? The size, they're larger than life. Because okay. if you do a portrait that's life size, it tends to make the subject look small and less significant. So they're larger than life. But maybe 120%. And um, I always work in bronze. The finished work is always finished in bronze. I've had a lot of... Uh, incredible experiences working with foundries in different countries. And currently I've been working in China and it's been a, just a, an amazing, amazing experience. This one is called No, No the Gas Mask. 
And it was motivated by this whole idea of war. Why nobody says no, just no, stop making war, done with war. And so this conversation evolved into the trauma that war presented to the subject. The body is calcified. The real forms of the body are no longer there. And the um, headdress is again, it's a combination of, and I didn't pull up the, the back of this one. Unfortunately, I can get it if anybody's interested. It's actually a gas mask that's worn as a headdress. And in one of the goggles eyes of the gas mask is a rose. So you have the blind eye and then you have the rose, which was a kind of offering of peace. Okay. Um, in the was... chat, there uh, someone said, "Is there, I guess there is there an image online, I think of your daughter that there were... Yeah. Do you have a website? Yeah, yeah, leahpoller.com. Okay. That's my name, and you'll it'll come up right away. Okay. Um, this was probably the most important piece I've, I've done in terms of a commissioned portrait, somebody very well known, and what it turned into. Okay, this... This is called Double Dare, and it's Fred Ho, who was a legendary jazz musician, Chinese American, who literally transformed the bass jazz, uh, the bass uh, saxophone. And um, I heard, I love music, and I live in Harlem, and so I was out all the time, I, you know, listening to live music, and I went to a concert by Fred. And I was so taken by the music. It was so unbelievably earth-shaking, so, so incredible. And his person, the very sense of this man was so enormous that I asked somebody that had told me about the event, I said, how do you meet a man like that? And they said, well, I'll introduce you. So I was introduced to Fred. I met with him maybe two or three times. And a part of the process that is essential to how I approach a portrait is the time I spend in conversation with the subject. Um, I don't think I could ever sculpt an enemy. They would have to be a friend in some way. And they become that, you know, when you when you find out what makes a person tick, they become real and then they kind of grow on you and they become part of you as well. And so the dialogue begins. For me, the portraits have never been uh, a monologue. They've always been a dialogue. So at that point, you know, Fred said, well, what do I do? And I told him and he said, well, I wanna see what you do. And he came to my studio and he saw the work and he said, how about me? And I said, oh my God, I couldn't believe that I would have the opportunity to sculpt this man. but. I didn't know at the time that he was dying, that this was going to be the last portrait and that it was a really incredibly important to him. The man was um, not just a musician, he was a writer, he was a philosopher, he was political, he was an activist, he could do anything that he set his mind to do. He was absolutely one of the most intense, profound, extraordinary and exceptional beings I'd ever met. And when he came to me, he was in, he was ravaged by cancer. It had taken over his body. He had already had massive surgeries. And in order to do the portrait, I had to move my studio into my kitchen because the studio wasn't warm enough for him. And so we worked, in the kitchen and when I was told how much time I had, it was like a record, it was like, when you call it a sprint to the finish line. We worked feverishly on the portrait and was able to, um, I think, produce something that was totally about the man. And I can give you some indications. Most of the portraits ever done about a, um, a musician show them with their instrument. And Fred was his instrument. 
So running up his whole chest here are the keys for his saxophone. And then you say, well, God, you know, keys for a saxophone. How do you get keys for a saxophone? I knew I wanted him to have the sax and I knew he was his own instrument. So I just said to somebody that was playing jazz, where do you get saxophone keys? And he said, how many do you need? I'll bring them to you. So all these things kind of like took over in, in, the, in the relationship with Fred. Um, at the very end, oh, then this in, in his vest pocket, which is actually piercing his skin, is a, um, a Chinese tile with a, a good luck a message on it. And Fred looked at it, he said, you know, you've got it inside out. And that's kind of what these portraits are about. They're about taking a person and turning them inside out. He was difficult in a way that you have no idea. This man was all about excellence. And he, as a professor, he was legendary. If you showed up one minute late for the class, the door was locked. And his opinion was, you didn't care enough to be here on time. I don't care enough to teach you, right? So he was the most demanding, most exacting person I've ever been in the company of. He taught me so many things that I would never ever have learned had I not been in this relationship. And when it was finished and he had a chance to see it and it was exhibited at BAM uh, when he did a memorial concert uh, it's been in lots of other venues. Um, I said, so, you know, Fred, is it okay? Is it okay? Yeah, how do you feel about this portrait? And he said, I dared you to capture me, and you did. And I said, well, I dared you to let me capture you. And there was a time during the 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 sittings that um, he, he broke down. He literally opened his soul, his heart, everything you could imagine, and his life story poured out. He shared it with me. It was a catharsis that was actually visible. And I've never shared any of the details with anyone because it was very personal, but this man, um, he shed his skin for me. He did, he turned himself inside out for me. And it was probably the most transformative of any portrait commission I've ever, I've ever done. I don't know do you, if you want me to go find the images of the back and the sides, you can see them online as well. Um, after he passed away, his portrait was at BAM for a while and I'd go over there and uh, I showed up one day and there was one of his students in front of the portrait crying. And I said, if I could do that, if I could present this person in his essence, in his, not, not a picture of him, not a, an exactitude of him, but what he was about, then I'd achieve something that was my personal quest. And when I saw that person crying in front of the sculpture, I knew they were in communion with the subject. Okay. That went off. It's a very powerful story. Um, well, you know, I, I told you when we were queuing up that I finally figured it out that I don't make art, art makes me that I am who I am because of these people who pose for me. This is one of my most recent works. This is a Rastafarian, one of the sweetest, kindest, gentlest, poetic individuals I've ever encountered. Um, I, I, have, I, I don't even know how to describe the time we spent together, it was, it was like having, well, I gave him the name, um, my sunflower man, because every time he would show up in, in the studio and I only worked when I had my subject with me. I never wanted to work without the living person in my presence. Um, 
with Jasm, it was every time he showed up, it was like a field of sunflowers. And as the time wore on and he would turn his head and he had these dreadlocks that went down to almost to the floor. And every time he kind of whip them up into some dew on top of his head, they were a different shape. It was, it was a real trial, you know, to try and figure out what exactly were these dreads doing because they were always changing. Um, he was very close to nature. And so you can see he's wearing on his shoulder a, a big leaf from a big plant. Um, same thing. You look at people who don't know the man and say, oh, he looks so sweet. Well, he was the sweetest, kindest soul I've ever I've ever encountered. And he helped me to understand that I was not making portraits. I was making soul catchers. So in a very elaborate sense, the portraits are not visuals of a person. They're a capture of the soul. Okay. And can I, you uh, mention, uh, can you mention what, how you think the works are changed each time the person arrives and whether that time period changes the, the piece as you're going along? Um, since you're talking about capturing their soul, do you think each individual time or is it really about getting to know them just as an overall situation and so so you know we're the reason i love sculpture and that i feel like it taught me everything i needed to know about the world is that it exists in three dimensions as do our bodies it exists in time because it's durable it exists in space because it occupies space and it transmits an emotion and that's who we are as humans. I don't think of, of any of this as, um, you know, statuary. I don't think of it as uh, dead people or not alive. They're very alive. And um, I had a wonderful professor at the Beaux-Arts and very early on, he gave me an assignment. He said to go to this museum in Paris, go to a particular room spend two hours in that room and then come back and tell me what you saw. So the room was very large and it had about 30 or 40 busts and they were all on the same level pedestal. And I spent two hours in that room and I looked and looked and looked and I went from one to the other to the other. They were all like in a semicircle. And I went back to the professor and he said, so what did you see? And I said, some were alive and some were dead. He said, that's right. That was the lesson. Mm -hmm. So. Right. Well, thank you, Leah. That was fascinating. And it's uh, very interesting hearing about your process and how you engage the, um, the your subject. Anyway, so our, our next artist is Mary Giancoli. Hi. Where is she? Um, nice to meet you all. So I have my stuff. It's on a website. So I guess I do share screen. Yeah. Yep. Okay. okay. <laughs> okay. No. Hmm. But how do I, how do I see? I don't know if I can, let me try to pull this up. When you share, you can just share the, uh, that page, not the whole screen. So that will make it a bit bigger or like that. Yeah, that, that works though. Like we can see. Okay. <laughs> like you can just screen, uh, just present the browser and then, you know, it's, it's not going to show, it's going to maximize the browser to the window. All right. I'm not quite sure how to do that, but. Um, so. 
I don't really do individual portraits. I mean, I do, but I did this work on um, the Mexican community in New York and working in black and white. I'm a photographer, uh, medium format. Um, so these are all, I started following um, a church on 14th Street, Our Lady of Guadalupe Church. And I just went to all the festivals and performances um, and photographed. So, and also um, I'm, I'm printing my own work in the dark room. So it's a pretty um, intensive documentary work. And I live in New York, so I did all the work in New York City. And then eventually I went to, to Mexico to, to continue the project. So these are three, um, three young girls performing. Um, they're performing, but I, I'm, I was curious to go before the performance or after the performance to, con to capture um, just to see what it's like before, not just the actual performance, but to get. Um, so I think they look kind of uh, monumental. Um, photographing from below. So that's one from this series. And they're big. They're, I mean, they're not that big. I mean, I, pr I think I printed them. Um, the, I printed them all various sizes, but up to 11 by 14. So some of them, actually that little one, it got, it was in um, an exhibition at the New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation. So they printed it something like 24 by 36, really big. And then this is another, this was at a competition um, up in the Bronx for um, a festival of um, Mexican expression. That. They're wearing the costumes from Veracruz, but they're here, it's still in um, New York City These two. Um, so this is the, it could be her mother, it could be another um, family member getting her daughter dressed up. This is on the day of um, December 12th, which is a major holiday um, for the Virgin of Guadalupe on at an outdoor altar on a on a at a church on 14th street so i think it's very mexican the sombrero the hat and also the features of this man and this is at the same church on this at this time the celebration takes all night. So people will come to pray starting at, in the afternoon and it will last until the next the next day. So it's like a 12 hour vigil on this day when people come to, make, to give thanks. So this little girl is representing her community and she's holding up flowers. So. This is in Mexico. So the same, for the same holidays, also for the Virgin of Guadalupe in Mexico, it lasts much longer. And this is a small village um, in, in the Puebla region um, where my husband was from that region. So we, we went there, um, I think, I, and we went, we just would go to these small towns and photograph inside churches. So they're, they're performing um, during this, this celebration these feast days. Also, this is fair. This is um. These people, you can see this. This is the Virgin of Guadalupe. So all these people are going on a pilgrimage from Puebla. They're walking two hundred miles to Mexico City to get their icons blessed. Um, and I'm photographing um, at night, just using available light. Again, outside, this is Mexico. So the guys have the serapes and the big, this is a huge guitar and they're they're playing outside at night, performing outside at night. 
the guy um, making an altar in a place called Cholula, so also in the Puebla region. Mary, why why do you choose black and white instead of color fo photographs? Oh, I mean, I also work in color, <laughs> um, but I love black and white. I mean, um, I like, you see more of the shadow and the light. I mean, why in Mexico would you photograph in black and white? Good question, <laughs> when it's such a colorful country. Um, I think it's more, I think there's something, um, I mean, for one thing, I can print black and white color. I don't know how to print. And it's just, I think it's more poetic. Mm -hmm. New York. So I grew up in Los Angeles. So this outfit, these guys are dressed like cholos, like the, the Mexicans, the Chicanos. Like this is so familiar to me. Um, Mary, there's a comment in the chat. Someone sure. uh, wrote, uh, beautiful images. What are you looking for when you shoot? <laughs> I'm looking for my 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 family, my my identity. Um, it's hard to say. Like, I don't, I'm just looking. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm looking outside of the world to find something that, that this kind of search for, um, hard to say. Um, hard to say. So, so I'm actually um, third generation Mexican American. My grandfather was born in Mexico, but um, and I grew up in California, which has a very strong uh, me Mexican feeling. But in in New York, I when I came to New York, it wasn't that wasn't the case. But um, so I wanted to find that that what it is, what it means to be Mexican, to be an immigrant, um, what, what is the community here? And so I, that's, that's what I was looking for. These guys are holding another um, icon at the, at the uh, this is the Basilica in Mexico City. So I went on this bus ride to get there, like very complicated to do these journeys. This is actually a different series. There, there's a follow-up question to okay. <laughs> sure <laughs> that one is um the question is how do you know when the photo works how do i know i don't know i mean you mean why do i why do i pick that image um i i guess i i i don't know who asked that question um maybe the person is asking what is it about that subject or that you feel like it warrants that um, taking that photograph or keeping that photograph too? I'm sure you take many, many photographs, but for example, this photograph. Um, this, okay, this is a different series, but it's, I mean, it's part of the same project. So the other one was the Virgin of Guadalupe. This is Quetzalan, in um, which is a small pueblo magico. And for he here, I, I I wanted to see. I went there because I was interested in um, finding these women who are weavers. So in this photograph, I think for me, why it works is because she's she's doing something. She's showing the her the technique of weaving um her gesture um it's a backstrap loom and i think also the expression on her face she's engaged she's she's i want to capture people candidly mm -hmm. so naturally and candidly um, and it's also square. So when you use the square image, it's not the same as using the standard, which is the 35 millimeter. But the way you watch a film, it's all, it's always the horizontal one to one and a half ratio. So this is a little different using the square. Um, so I'm interested in documenting these traditions that that we don't have this kind of thing in the United States. 
you know, capturing all these cultural, special cultural uh, kinds of events and mm -hmm. talent. Um, in, someone commented that the photos are very powerful and emotional. Oh, thank you. I would agree. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, this one I haven't shown, but I really love it. So this is the same place and it's a rodeo, but this kid is so tiny. Can you see that kid on the horse? I can barely see it. Yeah. Riding side saddle. So so again, in, in the West, where I'm from, in the West, horses, rodeos, it's very common. And then so I think part of it is like this nostalgia kind of trying to re rediscover that the, these things from my childhood and then finding them in other places. Um, I, another person commented how sensitive and caring your photographs are. Wow, thank you. <laughs> um, this is Atlisco, Puebla. So the um these are you know three men on these benches and I did a series on these benches because this is the town the Zocolo the town square and every bench he here and we have benches here too in in New York City when you go to a park um there's a bench that you can sit on mm -hmm. but these benches they're made out of Talavera they're made of the tile that's specific to Puebla. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And every scene, this little square thing, is something from the city. So can you imagine if we did that in New York? If if there was a, in Washington Square Park, if every bench had a scene of the city. So it's we do the same thing in New York. We sit on the benches and we talk to our friends. So that was another one. This is an old couple. So you can see they're a couple, but they're very they're still separate. <laughs> they have that old. Now, did you talk to them at a, or was it a candid shot? Um, so or that's candid. I mean, these people. For example, good question. Oops. Oh no. <laughs> what did I just do? Um, yes, in some cases I talk to the people. I think they're not so much. Wait a minute. What did I do? You just um you have another tab next to the one you you, you <laughs> were on. Say that one that says Yeah, that one. Go back there. No. Here we go. Yeah. Okay. So so yes, I would talk to some people. Um, or I would just take the picture. These people did not want to talk to me. <laughs> so they turned around, but I still thought they were so beautiful. I mean, just the silhouette and they're in, so a lot of the people I'm photographing are indigenous. Um This is in uh, Tijuana. It's a different trip. We have two questions in the chat. What year were these photographs taken? And... They, um, what year? I started in 98. So these are a long time ago. So between 98 and 2003. And then the one in Tijuana is later. So it's 1998 to 2005. But the ones in Quetzalan are 2003. Hmm. And what camera do you use? Well, here I was using a Yashica medium format. This is this is Brooklyn. This is later. Oh no, this is early. So here's a color picture. <laughs> Let's see one more. So then I did a series. This is um. This is the Popocatépetl vo volcano, and then this little boy is wor is watching his um, 
little brother, little sister, and then the parents are working in the fields. So these people are, you know, they're, many of them also come to our country to work in the fields. So, um, yeah, these are older, but I have, let's see what else. I'm gonna show you something. Uh, these aren't that good. <laughs> Can I try to find that's a color from these um these weavers? Beautiful. Thank you. So here, um I and now you just use natural light. So you can see um, details of what the, her, this is her home. I've got something hanging in it. So this is the same, see, I think this works better in black and white. <laughs> I showed you this before in black and white, but right. I, yeah, I think the black and white is better than the color. I agree. <laughs> it, it's something about the mood that the black and white evokes. Yeah. Uh, someone is, uh, Catherine has asked, uh, Mary, by making the photos, do you become friends with the people? Um, sometimes, I mean, with this, with this body of work, um, I sent, I, I printed a, a set of photographs and sent them back to this community. Um, so, and then they invited, you know, the lady who was the um, director of tourism, I showed this work in San Francisco and then she wrote to me and said, you can come and we'll, you know, we'll show you around. So I, so in, in a way, yes. Um, but of course they're in Mexico and I'm here. <laughs> They they seem to have a timeless quality. It's sort of like you can't set them in a certain day, certain time period. Mm -hmm. Maybe that was intentional. Maybe yeah. I mean, um, and someone is asking, where do you do your printing in New York City? Where? Um, great question. So today I was printing in the dark room. Um, I went to Hunter college for my graduate degree but I actually um have a friend there who's he has a dark room at Hunter College and I use that for printing black and white and then um I'm, I haven't really found a place I like <laughs> I've tried many labs so for I use color resource center um which is near international center of photography it's pretty good um and then I found this new place um contact photo lab but they don't I I like to work with um, negatives and chromes. And so a lot of the printing now is digital. So it's hard to find something, a place that will do, co color resource will print from actual film. Okay, so this, these, these women, this is a beauty contest for indigenous women and they're in front of the cathedral. So they make these, these are all handmade costumes. And then the the woman who, these men that are on the right with these hats on, they, they get to vote on who's the best. And then this is um, same costumes, but this is the procession of the wax. So this cross is in is made of wax. So this is a ceremonial procession. And these guys, you can hardly see it, but these guys, I don't know if you've heard of the voladores. They're the um, Totonac Indians that um, they fly from the pole, the top of a pole. So they're upside down. So it's really um, spectacular to watch it. Um, Lee, Lee has commented that there is a nostalgia for ritual. Do you miss it in your life? 
Yeah, of course. Yeah. Today I was thinking I've got to go back to Mexico. <laughs> and I have this holiday I, from my job. I have a holiday, but I'm trying to figure out, you know, in a, in a couple, in two, three weeks, we have some days off. So I'm just trying to figure out going back. Well, um, we're sort of running out of time and we have another artist, Catherine Ludwig. So, um, do you want to um, wind down? Yeah, sure. So, so, so um, yeah. So, thank you so much for for having a look, and for all your um, uh, inspiring comments. Thank you, mm -hmm. Catherine. Hi, uh, my daughter's just going to help me share. <laughs> okay. Okay. You cannot share screen while the other participant is sharing. You have to stop sharing your screen. You have to stop share. Mary. Okay. Mary. Mary. <laughs> okay. Hi. Uh, so Sophia's going to make it work. Yeah. Is it good? Is it working? Okay. Am I, am, is my unmute on? Can you guys hear me? You sound good and it looks good. Okay, good. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, so um so I've made um really maybe 800 portraits. Like I've made a lot of portraits in my life and um I I I do all the genres, right? So I do a landscape and um but for me like the landscape is always like the place that people know, so it's a kind of portrait of the place and if I do a still life, it's all these objects people know. Go, I know what that thing. I I own that thing. So, so the portraits sometimes combine those things. But anyway, um, I brought it some portraits. I brought it twenty portraits um, on my screen. I haven't done it before, but uh, see if I can do this. Um, okay, so I have a couple for. I I work in oil and watercolor. My watercolors are very large sometimes, like forty by sixty inches. And I always work from life, which means I have to cart the whole huge board to the person. And uh, and I and I find that makes it more lively. I like when people move and talk to me while I'm painting. Um, and I just have a knack for getting a likeness. Like I don't have a, I don't have a method. I wasn't really trained in portraits. I just thought, oh, I'll just do them. And then, and then people like them. So that helped me a lot. Okay, wait a minute. Now it's what well, do it. So wait a second. Okay, there. So here's an oil that I did. The, the, these are kind of recent portraits. This is an oil of Connie, who's one of the models of the Art Students League, where you can still do portraits. And um, everybody knows her. So it was really a pleasant to do it of her. And um, it was a very strong likeness. Um, it's, um, I guess it's about uh, a, a three foot by four foot. Um, and I find, I asked Mary, you know, if she gets to know the people, because like by doing the portraits, most people don't have you stare into their eyes for four straight hours with like really looking at them. And I'm looking at shapes, but for them, it's like this kind of permission to talk. And I like when people talk. So um, it gives really a sense of their real self. And I think this is really Connie. She's sort of a, a beautiful, tired person. So um then I have one other oil, which is my daughter, Sophia. It's very large. Um, sometimes I do people's children in oil because people love that, right? I don't know if you can see that it's a, the screen is not good because uh, I have our, our images also, but there. So that's a large oil I made of Sophia on Toronto Island. I'm originally from Toronto. And she just stood there and I painted her. And um, it's a very, they're all very strong likenesses. Uh, but I also think that, um, it has, uh, people become kind of emotional after they see me do the portrait because then they'll come around to look because they can't really look till I'm finished. And uh, I've had some real experiences with people like, you know, my daughter knows that I can paint, but um, one of my big things in portraiture was painting large groups of people. So I started off in my master's degree, I started to paint um, hated groups. And so I went to paint the Southwark Police in London where I did my master's. And um, uh, one of them walked around behind and saw it and started, so he started to cry when he saw the portrait. Very tough guy, guy who had been burned in his face, 
by you know cigarette burns like he had been at a very tough place the bridge southwark bridge and i find that it's very emotional for people to have a porch and have people he said you got me you got me and started to cry I thought, oh my god so that's very meaningful to me to make portraits um this is um this is my daughter in one of the now i'm going to show you the large watercolors this is a 40 by 60 watercolor it's in Toronto, so I can't really show you in the room, but it's a very large watercolor of Sophia. You know, in a watercolor, there's no mistakes, right? You, and you can't sketch first, I don't, I just go. I might start at the hand. I might've started the skull on her sweatshirt. Um, I just start wh whatever takes me first and just go. So uh, this is what she was studying at the time in her philosophy degree. And um, the scale of watercolor, which is such a bright medium because the light shines through the transparent color, um, is very powerful to do watercolor large. It's just as powerful as um, as oil. Um, tell me if I'm going too quickly. Of course, I can't look at the chat or anything because I have too many things on the screen for you to see well. Um, but it's so that, that project with the Southern Police, which we'll hear, but that led to a lot of projects with large groups of people that people didn't like. So I painted, um, when I was in London, I was asked to go to uh, Vegas where Playboy had moved and the, the bunnies invited me to come paint the bunnies because they said, well, we like how you paint women. And so I went to paint the bunnies and, you know, a strong feminist at the time was like, oh my God, the bunnies. And my husband said, I'm not going. And I took my 12 year old daughter and it was so great to paint these people because you really get to know people when you sit quietly with them for such a long period of time. Um, so that was a big show for me and led to a lot of press where I was known for painting unusual groups. And then I would have art shows inviting the people who don't like them. So then I had, um, I painted a lot of New York feminists. I came to AR Gallery and um, I was on their fellowship when I first came to New York, they were really great. And I did this huge group of women who were working with the gallery. I usually do maybe um, 20 up to 75 portraits. So I did 75 portraits of the US military who invited me to paint portraits to show at the Pentagon. Um, all, um, you know, um, all ranks, all ages. And that's now in their welcome area of the Pentagon. And I'm Canadian, I don't know anything about the military. So that was really an honor for me. It was right after 9-11. And they had a big space there um, because when the building was destroyed, they remade it into like just kind of a white space, kind of like a gallery. And it's all plaques and eagles there. And like they don't have beautiful color portraits. So they really loved portraits of their, their own people. And um, they cleared an office building for me in um, New York. And uh, I would just meet with whoever they sent in whatever he or she was wearing on that day. And uh, I just, you know, sometimes I was painting camo, sometimes it was like Arctic camo, sometimes it was, you know, they have many uniforms and you have to get it right, especially like the metals because they know what's right. I have no idea what it is, it's just shapes, but I have to get everyone right because they know their metals. Anyway, here we are at Toronto Island. Uh, it's another 40 by 60 with our, our poodle and my daughter and um, sort of hold up for COVID. Um, you know, there's, African painting on the wall. So some of these objects are things that are meaningful to her, oranges, um, you know, she listened to her music. I hope I'm not going too fast. I'm just really aware of the time for you. Oh, that's okay. I, I don't think we have another artist. So we're-, we're Wouldn't good. it be terrible if I was just talking and you couldn't hear me all this time? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that, could, that could happen, right? Uh, we would okay. have let you know. All, all good. Otherwise, we, okay. would, we would shout. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so let me just take the sort of in the way of this thing. I don't know how to take it off. Sophia, how do I make this thing leave, this black thing, the top? I want, I want, Sophia, can you just, this is the actual Sophia. Sophia, can you just, um, can you just take off uh, this black thing so that I, yeah, I want this black thing to move so that I can. No, but I can see it. I can't. I can't X out the the painting. You did it. Okay, thanks. <laughs> I'm glad I have four kids because they're all good at different things. <laughs> we, <laughs> the have, wrong uh, kinds of things. 
someone okay. commented in the chat uh, how yeah. beautiful your work is and uh, wonderful Thank stories. Thank you. Well, this is these are this is my sons, who are identical twins, and they um and I painted a, a forty by sixty of them with their interests. Like one was doing math, and one was you know playing um, trumpet. And uh, one was doing origami. So there was this big, or he built this big origami bird. And um, it was, um, it was at their, I'm Jewish. So it was their, their bar mitzvah. And, you know, I felt it was important. Um, and it was the same from, for my daughter. And then I did it for all kinds of bar mitzvah and bat mitzvah kids who asked, whose parents asked me, you know, I would, I made these paintings that they would then use on their invitation card as their card. Cause it's much more personal than just, you know, something that was kind of, formal and um and so now we kind of always have this right so i think that's the beauty of portraits so you you always have a memory of who you were especially when you're doing um, family members or other people's family members um some people really like oil uh because there's a kind of permanence to it and that's great i i i just take the oils into their home and i lay down the tarp the tarp and i just go but i also like to make these big watercolors which are very meaningful for people they're very alive. Um, so that was five. Let's go to six. Okay, now, now, so those are all the really big ones, okay? So these are now going to be um, 22 by 30s, which is the sheet size for arches, right? So um, this is a, a big one I did of Sophia during the shutdown. Um, and I just tell people, as I did to her, just, just take any pose you want. Just, I, I don't really care. And uh, and and just wherever you feel comfortable. So she made a kind of a haha -ha clown thing. But you know, by painting, I realized what beautiful hands she has. You know, it causes me to really look at someone like they like being looked at. In this, I guess it's a Martin Bieber <laughs> total acceptance way. You know, this total love way, or, or maybe it's Maslow or something. You know, where you're just completely accepting of them because you're painting them and you love them. And it, and I even when I painted complete strangers. I kind of fall in love with them as I'm painting them because I see things. You really see inside people. Um, and so, yeah, that, that was a strong likeness as well. Her kind of mischievous impiness, which is nice in a young person. So Catherine, uh, do you take photographs yeah. of them and then paint yeah. from the photographs or do they- see Never, them? never. I have it to, I, I, I would like to because it would be lucrative, right? People say would want to send you photographs, but I just find that those are like, for me, those are dead because it's, it's a second stage. I mean, the photograph might be alive, but for me to paint from the second stage, I know that people do it. And I know that they make very beautiful portraits from photos, but for me, they're always a little dead. So I always have to paint from life. Because, um, it's not very calculating when you paint live. You know, like here, this is, it's hot, it's sunny, we're in Florida. And uh, I think it's two two twenty or something, two thousand and twenty, when we just sort of said we're we're out of here, <laughs> and uh, or, or two thousand twenty one, and you know, so there's a lot of accidents happen when you're in a natural place, and things get in it, like those little people in the background, or um, it's not very, it, it's somehow too pat when it's in a photo for me, or in a studio, unless they come to my studio, which is fine, and then it becomes another kind of thing, but. This kind of bright, brilliant sunshine could only be Florida for me. And uh, there she is, you know, she's, she's, she's hot and she's tired. And um, cause, because she's working online as everybody was during the, the shutdown. So I, I feel like I get more things in there when it's, when it's live. Um, and also it's kind of a, a way for me to experience things. Like, like I have fun painting live. I like to go to Florida or let's say someone you know, I have someone in Paris, a collector, who will say, Kathy, do you want to come for a couple of months and you'll, you'll paint? And so then I'll paint him and his daughter. And I painted his parents last time because he's a collector. And that's so great because then I got to hear his parents speak French for four hours. And uh, I got to watch them cooking. I did a portrait of them cooking. So they have each their special way of holding the knife, you know, cleaning the... Uh, the decay on the fruit, like there's, there's things I hadn't anticipated. His mother's sort of, you know, her hair, her sort of sweaty hair, cause she's been in the kitchen. And just to be invited into the kitchen is a big deal in Paris. So yeah, I always paint live and I have a lot of fun experiences that way. Okay, now these are part of the military photographs. So there were 75 done. 
And um, yeah, I got to know each of these people, some of whom still write me. So this is um, a guy in the army who wrote me then, hey, I'm in Italy, Kathy. You, know, <laughs> you, know, you, you get to know these these people you wouldn't have known before, but I felt it was important at this stage in his career, I think it was Sergeant Gonzalez. Um, and uh, that was sort of his manner. You know, his manner was very, um, um, I mean, he must have been about 19, 20, you know, re really some of them were very young and to get that about them. And then some of them were, okay, like this man, he enlisted during Vietnam and he was just winding down in his career. He'd served in three branches as many of the more senior people do. All those medals are correct because it's important to him that they're correct. And uh, I have no idea what I'm painting when I paint him. But I know I'm painting a man who had a lot of great stories to tell me. I think he'd been Marines, Air Force, and um, uh, Army. Um, and then his, okay, so his son came later that week, because I had people all day, all the time for months. And um, his son came wearing the boots that he just come from Afghanistan in. So he's wearing those those dusty boots. He brought them on purpose. Because I say, wear what you want, bring what you want. Like the Coast Guard brought their flippers and their, all their <laughs> and, and the wetsuits. And so his son came and then he had another son who was just going off for his, he was just deploying for his first time. And he was so young and he was so um, like keeping on a cheerful face, but it was a family tradition. So I got to know those things about this family. And the one who was just coming back, he was quite bitter and, and upset about his experience. So, you know, that's, that's part of the, the learning experience of being an artist. Uh, Leah has observed that you're very fluid and free in your technique and ease with colors. I have, yeah, because I, I sort of have no technique. Like there's no, there's no preliminary drawings. There's no drawing on the canvas in pencil. Like, no, there's just like, this is, this is a, a young woman in the Coast Guard and she brought her, her knife that they clean um, the bottom of the boats with, like what are they call carbuncles. They clean off the bottom of the boat. And she was really something. She was a really great girl. And uh, so she chose to wear her, her stuff. but you see the look in her eye, she's a very focused girl. She's exactly who you'd want on your team. <laughs> and um, she was tough and, and young. Um, and by painting her, I got to know, my, most people look at a uniform and they just, um, they just have all kinds of assumptions about that person. But everyone I painted in the military was a different kind of person, obviously, with different politics, with different family situations. I think she had a daughter, uh, like, like, a, like she was very young, she had a daughter and she was looking after her. I mean, they each had their own story as, as you know, that's true of like, let's say when I painted the bunnies, they're all very different. The cops in London, all very different. Um, I kind of find a piece in each person that I really like, and that's what I'm painting. So she will leave now, goodbye. Oh yeah, so this is, a, this, is this wonderful woman in the Navy. She's one of the first women I painted there. Um, uh, her, her last name is Estrella. And she was just so um, full of life, this girl. I just loved painting her. I, and I have affection really for all of them. It was great. And then, you know, they'd come in, I'd know them really well for four hours. They would tell me things like someone on a plane who tells you everything and then they're gone. Um, because there's no money between us, right? They haven't commissioned me. It was something set up actually originally by the Navy and then the Marines wanted to get in on it. And then um, I said, we have to do the Coast Guard, you know? because they were great too, but they were like, oh, they're, they're not really armed, you know, like they have kind of internal jokes, the military between each other. Um, and um, I, I really, I, I love this girl. And the woman who set it up was a Lieutenant Commander and is now a commander in the Navy. And these are sort of all her friends and they started it going. And then we got to 75. So did you paint any, um 
or encounter any people in those uh, military paintings that you didn't like or didn't connect with and had a negative feeling about and you still had to complete the painting? No, it was, um, I was the second showing at the Pentagon after 9-11. So it just happened someone had been booked first. So then I was in there and I, I felt like um, at that time, I felt like um, being Canadian, I just felt like, well, what can I do? Like I was very grateful to the Americans and I, f I really felt a lot of, of sadness for New York. And um, I just thought, well, what can I do? And then that, the, the lieutenant commander phoned me on my cell phone. And I thought, oh no, like in my second conversation in my mind, what's going on with my, with my O-1 visa? You know, she <laughs> said she was from the, the Navy. At first I thought someone was pranking me. And then I said, well, how did you get my number to sell? And she said, we are the U.S. Navy. <laughs> we met in the village and talked about this project she had in mind. It was really just originally for Fleet Week where uh, um, the Navy has a standing thing where during Fleet Week they show, um, like they'll have speakers and so on at the National Arts Club. There's always had a thing at the National Arts Club. For, so she said, well, we have a showing venue and I saw your stuff online with people in uniform. And I, if you'd like to do it, I'd like to do, you know, we'd like you to do it for us. And I said, well, the only stipulation is it's not gonna just be high ranking people. And also nobody's taking home these paintings, right? We're gonna have a contract. Nobody's gonna like abscond with these paintings because I'm not doing them. Um, and I have to, and nobody can say they don't like a painting. Like if it doesn't matter if they don't like it, it's still gonna be in the show. And then they all, they all did like it, but I just didn't want any pressure around. I wanted to, I think my feeling for uh, the Americans uh, was very strong and I came out in the painting things with a lot of good feeling for those people. I mean, they made serious sacrifices, right? It's terrible to go to those places and um, a lot of their friends died. And I don't know what happened to them afterwards. Maybe some of them did, but I just thought that they were usually, they're kind of like police where they just want to do good. They're like, they're like kids from small towns. They just want to do good. This is their thing, whatever that means. I don't know if that's changed for people in the military, but it was very strong then. And um, I really meant it when I said, you know, thank you for your service. I really meant it because like, I don't want to go to those places. I was actually asked by um, um, someone who was working with King Abdullah, would I come to Jordan and uh, teach his children painting and paint there? And I thought, I am not going <laughs> because things were peaceful at that time, but you just don't know. So I don't, since I am the mother of, of a lot of children, I just try to just make these sort of happy, safe situations where I'm painting. Um, so this is, a, this is a new group of paintings. So I, I did a huge project, I think it was um, 115 paintings called Everyone Who Helped Me Get My O-1 Visa. Because when I first came to New York, I didn't know anybody. And I thought, well, I'll just paint everyone who's helping me. And by that process, I'll know them a little bit in a nice way. So I invited everyone who helped me, you know, be it the secretary at my lawyers, be it, um, this, is, this, th this is a collector who purchased all my paintings of the New York skyline. And those paintings were later, um, uh, the JPEGs were used by Mayor Bloomberg all over the city. They were like on every, on every screensaver. They, it, was, it was a really popular project. It got me in the New York Times twice. And um, he purchased them all as a way to pay for my, um, my eventual green card. So he really helped me, this collector. I mean, he's happy he has those paintings because they really distinguish themselves in time. But I'm very grateful to him because otherwise I don't know how I could have done it. I, I came here with nothing. <laughs> and total disapproval of my family to do it. But I thought I got to do it. So I got the fellowship at, um, at AIR and I got another fellowship at Free Dimensional and I got a third fellowship at Soho 20, but then they couldn't do it because I already had the other two and they didn't feel that was fair. But because of that strong response, I felt that I had to do it. And then when he came through with the money, I thought, wow, I got to do it. So this is this is, this is collector who is, who is now a good friend of mine because he has collected over the years. And um, I actually did the, a uh, bat mitzvah portrait of his daughter that's on their card. And um, I think the next one is his wife. It's his wife. 
who's also, she, she, I actually knew her first and then she introduced me to her husband. So, um, so we have a longstanding friendship now that's two way instead of them just being buyers of my paintings. Um, okay, then the mayor, the mayor did a thing. Okay, Mayor Bloomberg at the time had, I don't know if you remember this, it was a big deal, it was Immigrant Heritage Week every year. So he invited me to, he didn't know me, but he, his, his staff was very active. Mayor, Mayor Bloomberg's staff used to find artists to help. And he'd throw all kinds of money at projects, not just to me, but just to like big projects. So one was Immigrant Heritage Week. And um, during Immigrant Heritage Week, I, there was a lot of stuff in the news about different um, hatreds between different religious groups in Brooklyn for some reason. And, um, I decided to do uh, to take these portraits I was doing and to paint all these groups that were supposedly uh, being made fun of or hating on each other, but also being made fun of. I heard I heard hip artists making jokes about different groups, and I thought this is so wrong. So I invited those artists and fifteen members of each group to uh, a big party where all their portraits are on the wall. So I'm like the person at the party who everybody knows and introduces everyone to each other. And um, the, uh, the older people, the older women of these groups made food and the young people brought their music and they sort of forgot about hating each other. <laughs> it's really a good project. And it was, it was in all the press and um, the minister of culture came, showed up and um, Fortunados where I lived in Brooklyn showed up with three huge cakes for the people, they decided to donate three huge cakes. I'm talking about massive cakes, like the size of big tables. Um, one was the New York flag, one was the American flag, and one was the Betsy Ross. So this is one of the portraits from that series. This is a rabbi um, in Brooklyn, um, pretty pretty young young rabbi, around the corner from where I live now. Um, and uh, then I am so I painted Orthodox Jews. I painted um, nuns. It was very hard to find nuns because people aren't signing up to be nuns that much anymore. But uh, these lovely women, these nuns, and I got to know them. Um, and in the four hours of painting each one, you know, they tried to convert. <laughs> but I saw their point, you know, <laughs> it was okay. I thought it was good to talk to them. Um, I thought that they were very, very lovely women. And uh, again, even though they wear the uniform of the habit, right, um, which I like painting, they're very different kinds of women. And they, they told me about Jubilee year when they decided to go to Vegas together and go gambling as a bunch of friends. <laughs> People imagine that they know, oh, that's a nun or that's a rabbi. But they don't, that other rabbi, he wrote a book about um, Marvel comic book heroes. Like people are more than you imagine, especially when you spend all that time with them. And um, at a certain point, I went back for a while to Toronto because to, one of my daughters was in grade five. And I thought these kids, they're all sort of, they're sort of formed. They have, they have strong opinions, but they're not yet. They could at this point be anything in their life. They could do anything. So I painted, um, I think about 30 kids. Uh, and then that became this big project where I did 30 kids in, in Paris, 30 kids in London, 30 kids in Brooklyn, 30, you know, 30 kids in Toronto. And just talk to them about all their ideas while they watched me at paint and talk to me about painting. Um, and that's, of course, a watercolor. And they, they were all so, so lovely. And when they could see other people's portraits, it made them really happy. You know, that they saw kids from all over the world are still are wearing the same T-shirts as them. <laughs> They're the same. All kids are pretty much the same because we have a kind of international culture going on now. Okay, now now I'm going to end up with um, uh, some of my family. So this is my father who died of old age. But um, this is a painting I made of him uh, when he was well, but old. And um, I'm really glad I made, I'm really glad to have made these paintings. You know, I think it's valuable if you're an artist to paint the people in your life because old photos are great but it's not the same as if you painted them. And this is a, a, a dead ringer for him. And so the cousins are like, wow, that portrait, you know. So I did him and I did my mother on the same day. 
Um, I guess he's about, I don't know, 85 here. And this is my mother, who's probably about the same. There. Oh, I can't hear you. Some, someone me? wrote, um, they always say every, every painting has a story and yours are fantastic. I love your series and the choices. Thank you. Well, I don't plan the painting and I don't know what's going to happen. Like, I don't start off thinking, oh, this will be her looking pensive or this will be her look. Like, she's a, she's a big, she's a, okay, she's now 105, okay? So she'll be 106 in May. So here she's relatively young. But she's seen many things because she was a teenager during the Depression. So she uh, she didn't have any money when she started, but you know, just like people came to America, she her father came to Toronto and um, from Poland, and she uh, they had nine there were nine children in the family. She bought out his business, and she she made her living on sweat work. She said just standing up in the shop selling things all her life, but she kind of loved selling too. So she, and then she trained my father in the business. He had been a police officer before and had served in the military for six and a half years. So it's funny, you do find the connections in your life. Like I didn't seek out the military, but then that came to mind, you know, and I didn't seek out the police really. Uh, but then, you know, it had a relevance in my life. And most people I find you do have something in common with most people, almost everyone. Once you're talking for four hours, you do link up in some way and then they feel uh, connected to you and they are kind of connected to you in a very broad way so I find especially in those things where, where where people aren't liked you know the if you if you make the effort you do find a connection and then you get a good portrait because you find the thing that that leaping thing between you that's not definable and I have one last one which I made about a week ago of my mother she she lived at home until she was 104 and then um, she and then she broke her hip, of course, right? So uh, now she she's fine. That was last year, and she's she's still herself. She follows all the news. She's read all the biographies, and she's watched American news for this many years. So it was a portrait in her. She twenty two by thirty. She just loved me, and she was watching um, the 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 Biden. Um, um, State of the Union address, and they had all those commentators coming on, and they all kind of looked the same, like <laughs> really strange. And so she was watching from her bed. You know, she has this kind of dumb quilt that someone gave her, and uh, she she's very savvy about politics. She she knows all about them and tells me the stories behind every single person's past. Nothing gets past her. Oh, oh. so you, thank you. Catherine, so much. We're uh, running out of time. I am sorry. I didn't really look at the chat. I'll look now because I didn't know how to do that with the screen. That's okay. So I, I was reading them as we went along. There was, there's a, a comment by Leah that it maybe is a, a wonderful uh, message to end the evening on. Uh, she states um, an overarching sense of humanity, perhaps only figurative work can project that sentiment which touches both the artist and the subject. Yes, I think that's true, Leah. And I, I, I like, I really enjoyed the photographs as well by Marianne and I like Leah's sculptures. And um, I think that when you do a portrait and someone is right in front of you and you're really engaged with them because you have to be, you're like looking behind their eyes into their heart, you know? Um, I think that um, it's a deep trust, a deep humanity flies between you that is like everybody knows it. Like everybody's in love for just that second. And I think that that's very big gift that we have as portrait artists. So. Yeah. If you can I could, ask a question, can I ask a question? Yes. Catherine, where, just where, where do you live? Um, I live in Dumbo. Okay. Right. But I'm born in Toronto. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. You're and uh, I'll give you guys a little secret, Catherine. You can take, if you have your little arrow keys, you can just yeah. flip your little arrow key up and down 
and go through all yeah. your images and you don't have to ever move that. Just keep it open and you move your arrow keys up and down. You go through all your images. Click, click, click with your arrow keys so you can save time. Oh, I see. Okay. okay. Thank so you. So you have you. arrow keys on your keyboard. You just hit the up or down and it'll go to the next image, up or down. Cool. Okay? Thank you. Thank You're you. You're welcome. <laughs> if you wouldn't mind stopping sharing your screen, Catherine, so we could all yeah. see each other. And, uh, I did it. Thank you. Wow, this thank was you. wonderful. Um, I personally uh, was just fascinated by all the artists and your connections with your subjects and the psychological connection and the stories. Um, bravo. It was uh, really fascinating and quite wonderful. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So thanks everyone for joining us and uh, hope to see nice you next to meet you. Are we going to uh -huh. do this again or how does this work? <laughs> well, we're having an open studio, I think, uh, on the 15th with um, land landscape and uh, street art. S but um, someone suggested in the chat that we do one for self-portraits, artist self-portraits, just a program on that. Um, on April 15th? Well, that one is, I believe, landscapes and street art. So we we just started experimenting with themes. So um, I think it it works very nicely, focusing on a theme. Yeah. Maybe we'll do self portraits next time. I was the person that suggested that. My name's Susan, and uh -huh. um, I I was the person that suggested that. My name's Susan, and yeah, I I'm a self portrait artist. That's what I do primarily. And I thought there might be other people, other artists that do that, that might like to share in um, their work. I didn't even think yeah. about this, but I have all these little sculpture boxes that are portraits. I haven't even thought about this because I'm so, it's an older body of work. It's interesting. It's interesting to look at this. Anyway, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining us and uh, hope to see you next week, April 1st, uh, when we have a uh, trialogue uh, with uh, Vernita. Vernita, we, uh, Doug, you want to talk a little bit? Uh, well, it's, it, it's Vernita, uh, Nemec, Vernita Nemec, who, who in the past, she's an artist, uh, mainly known as a performance artist. She, she was the executive director of A2A for about nine or 10 years back in the sort of 80s, 90s. A uh, very interesting person, and she's accompanied in this uh, piece next week by Barnaby Rue, uh, a painter, and uh, Bill Rabinovich, a painter. Uh, and what they have in common with each other is they they were the instigators of something called the Whitney Counterweight in, I believe it was 1984, uh, which drew a tremendous amount of people to Soho for a whole battery of exhibitions in opposition to the choices made by the Whitney. Uh, very popular that year and maybe for a couple of years. So they were sort of, you know, um, upstarts. So it's an in interesting look back at that and just generally at their own work. Um, I think you may enjoy it and I'll be introducing it. Thank you, Doug. And thank you, Maruna, for... Um navigating us through Zoom. And uh, thanks everyone again for joining us.